as Colleen said, my name is Todd Melligary. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here with Coordinated Health. Just wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I know everybody's busy and got lots of stuff going on, but hopefully it'll be worth your time. Uh, we'll talk about a bunch of stuff, and uh, myself, Frank, and Chris hopefully will answer any questions that you guys have. And just on that note, uh, this is just a very informal uh, presentation, so don't hesitate to stop me at any point in time if you have any questions, or certainly uh, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, as Colleen said, I'm Todd Melligary. Um, this is just a little bit of background. Uh, I went to medical school down in Philadelphia, then did my orthopedic surgery residency in New Jersey. Uh, after completing that, I did a year of what's called a sports medicine fellowship down at Union Memorial Hospital uh, in Baltimore. Uh, as part of that program, I had the privilege of helping to take care of uh, some of the colleges down there, Johns Hopkins, uh, Loyola, Morgan State, as well as some of the professional teams, including the Ravens. Uh, then came up here, uh, been here since 2006, and had, have had the privilege of uh, helping take care of the kids down at Eastern Area High School as well as uh, the athletes over at Lafayette College. Um, this is a list of the offices uh, where I go. Um, I'm here in the, the Wingap office uh, as well as uh, several of the offices down uh, uh, further in the valley, specifically uh, Emmerich Boulevard uh, and Greenwood Avenue and Easton. Uh, and then I do go over to New Jersey as well as uh, over to uh, Allentown. And in addition, I do go up to the uh, East Stroudsburg office. Um, so this is just an outline of what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, first, I was just gonna make a few general comments about children uh, and sports, uh, then focus more in uh, on the topic of the elbow. First, with just a little bit of basic anatomy, followed by some specific injuries. Uh, in terms of the injuries, we're going to talk about two different types of injuries, uh, both acute uh, injuries and what I consider to be overuse injuries. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about prevention and then at that point going to turn it over to the other guys uh, who are going to talk even more about that aspect of things. Um, so just a few uh, uh, ideas about kids in sports. Um, we're seeing more and more kids uh, get injured all the time. Uh, there's several reasons for that. Uh, kids are participating in organized and informal athletic activities at an increasing rate. Uh, they're doing so at a younger age. Uh, probably the largest increase we're seeing is actually among female athletes. Uh, and the reason we believe that kids are uh, um, more injured than uh, older people is because they're more susceptible to injury. Their skeleton is different. And uh, that's going to be one of the key recurring themes here tonight and probably the one uh, most important thing uh, to take away uh, is that kids are not uh, just uh, large adults. Excuse me, excuse me, kids are not just small adults. Um, just some facts, uh, greater than 800,000 kids age 14 and under are treated in ERs every year for sports related injuries. Uh, most of these injuries result from falls, being hit by objects. Um, a lot of them though uh, are because of overuse injuries, not necessarily specific uh, things that happen. Um, we believe that more than half of all organized sports-related injuries uh, can be prevented. Uh, and this is in large part because they are overuse injuries. We estimate that 30 to 50 percent of injuries in adolescents are from overuse. And oftentimes we see these in uh, sports that uh, result from uh, micro trauma, which is a, uh, an idea that has come up uh, from kids doing stuff that they do things over and over. And obviously uh, baseball, uh, pitching, throwing is one of those areas. And that's what we're going to concentrate on here tonight. Um, and again, this is the recurring concept here, is that uh, young athletes uh, are not small adults. Um, the fundamental difference uh, between uh, kids uh, and adults is the skeleton. Uh, this is actually a knee, um, and what you can see here on the left is the, an x-ray of a child. Uh, and you can see here that there's a line here and a line here. Now you don't see that in the x-ray on the right side. That's the growth plate. Uh, that's where the, the bone grows from. What that is, is uh, that's made of cartilage. Uh, cartilage doesn't show up on an x-ray, and that's why you see a line there. Uh, when we grow, those, that growth plate disappears and the line's not there anymore. The uh, important concept is that growth plate, that cartilage, is actually the weak link. Uh, any joint uh, is where two bones come together. Uh, and in order to provide stability, we have what are called ligaments. Ligaments are soft tissue structures that connect bone to bone. Now, in a child who has a growth plate, like we said, the growth plate is the weak link. That's actually weaker than the ligament. So when a child gets an injury, most often it's the growth plate, not the ligament. It's the reverse in an adult. An adult doesn't have a growth plate to injure, so what do we injure? We injure ligaments. Now on to some more specifics about uh, the elbow. Uh, the first thing I'm just gonna talk about is some basic anatomy. 
Uh, as most of you know, uh, the elbow is the joint between the shoulder and the wrist. Uh, the joint is made up of uh, three bones. The humerus is the bone between the shoulder and the elbow, and then there are two bones between the elbow and the wrist. The radius is the one on the outside, the ulna the one on the inside. Basically what that provides is there are two separate articulations. Uh, there's the articulation between the end of the humerus and the bone called the ulna, and then there's the articulation between the humerus and the bone called the radius in this area right here. And that will be important when we talk in a minute about the different functions of the elbow. As we said, any joint has ligaments. Ligaments are soft tissue structures that connect the bones and they provide stability. Uh, joints only go in a certain direction and that's because there are ligaments. There are three main ligament complexes when we talk about the elbow. There's the lateral collateral ligament which is on the outside which is the one on the far left. Then there's the ulnar collateral ligament which is the one on the inside oftentimes also referred to as the radial collateral ligament. And then there's the annular ligament, which is this one here, which is uh, in the front. Now that one controls the, with this part of the radius called the radial head. As we said, uh, because of the bony configuration and these ligaments, the elbow has four main planes of motion, uh, flexion, extension, pronation, and supination. This picture represents pronation and supination. Um, the easiest way to understand this is that when we talk about the elbow, we consider neutral position to be with the thumb up. If you go from thumb up to palm down, that motion is called pronation. If you go from thumb up to palm up, that's called supination. When I was taught anatomy, the easiest way to remember that is if you have your palm up, that's how you can carry a can of soup. So that's supination. And then pronation is the opposite. And then flexion and extension, most of you probably know, flexion is with the elbow bent, extension is with the elbow straight. So now on to some more specifics about the injuries. Like I said, I wanted to concentrate on two broad categories of injuries, uh, acute uh, and overuse. Acute are injuries that occur from a sudden event. You know it's something that happened. Overuse injuries, on the other hand, are those which build up over time. You don't necessarily recall a specific type of injury. The acute injuries are the sprains, the dislocations, and the fractures, uh, where the overuse injuries are the micro trauma. The specific uh, elbow injuries that are acute that I'm going to touch on, growth plate fractures, displaced fractures, uh, and dislocations. So what is a growth plate fracture? This is an elbow x-ray, and as you'll see, again, we see these areas here where these these radiolucent lines. Those are the growth plates. And as we said, in a child, that's the weak spot. So what can happen is you can get an injury to that part of the bone, and again, that is part of the bone, that's on the cellular level, the cartilage is damaged, and you may not see anything on an x-ray. So oftentimes what you have is you have somebody who presents, they know they had an injury, they have pain, they have swelling, and they complain of limited motion. So how do you figure out what's going on? Well, as we said, you look at the x-ray and you don't really see much, so it's basically a clinical decision. When I see somebody that comes in and it's a child and they have an open growth plate and they localize pain to that area, I assume that they have a growth plate fracture even if the x-ray looks normal. And so what do we do? The treatment for that is simply a cast. Uh, and for kids uh, who have open growth plates, they're lucky because they heal quick. Usually a kid will heal a broken bone, specifically a growth plate fracture, in about a month. So what we'll do, if that's what we believe the situation is, is we'll put them in a cast, we'll take it off in four months, and within a few days to a week after they come out of the cast, they're pretty much ready to go. Contrast that with a displaced fracture. Now that's when there's actually a crack in the bone that you can see. And I know that most of you don't spend time looking at x-rays, but I bet most of you can look at that x-ray and say, yeah, something just doesn't look right. Um, there's a crack here, and this part of the bone should actually be aligned right under here. And what's happened is there's a crack, and the bone is actually flipped backwards. Symptoms are actually very similar to the growth plate fracture, pain, swelling, and limited motion, but obviously in this case, you have a deformity. You can oftentimes see that there's something not right. This is just a clinical photograph. You can see, get the sense that there's some swelling and deformity there. Uh, the difference here is the treatment. Unfortunately, these often require surgery. Um, two things, first of all, you gotta get the, the bone back in place, and then you gotta hold it in place and let it heal. Sometimes we can just get it back in place by pushing on it. Sometimes we have to make, actually make an incision and, and use that to get it back in place. And then we have to stabilize it somehow. In this case, we, uh, the picture represents just some simple pins. Sometimes it's more involved with plates and screws. Now dislocation. Uh, you might look at this picture and say, well, gee, that looks kind of like the other picture. I mean, there's swelling, looks like, but there's a deformity. Uh, and, and that's oftentimes the case. Again, you have pain, you have swelling, you have deformity, you have limited motion. 
And again, in a situation where there's a dislocation, you're going to know something happened. Uh, there's going to be a significant amount of discomfort. So how do we figure that out? X-ray. Again, uh, a dislocation, the simplest way to look at it, it's like when the ball comes out of the socket. If you look at this picture here on the left, you see that this part of the elbow, which again, from what we talked about before, this is the humerus, belongs over here in this socket. A lot of times with elbows, they actually spontaneously reduce. Um, you'll still have the pain and the swelling and the deformity, but if it doesn't, then obviously that's some, uh, a situation where you need to seek medical attention. Um, treatment for this is pretty simple. You basically need to put it back in place uh, and then immobilize it. Most of the time uh, in a child, there's not going to be a significant ligament damage because again, it's the bone that's, that, that's the weak spot. This is just a simple representation of, of uh, a method of reduction, uh, which is uh, you know, pretty consistent. Just no matter what joint is dislocated, you basically need uh, some traction and then somebody holding counter traction. And for the most part, um, you know, not suggesting that you know, people try to do reductions on their own, but for the most part, the, the joints when they come out of place, they want to go back where they belong. So it's usually not that complicated. So now we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about what I consider to be overuse injuries. Uh, again, overuse injuries are a result of accumulation of microtrauma. I'm going to focus on uh, three specific entities, uh, Panner's disease, osteochondritis desiccans, and then uh, what, I, what oftentimes is referred to as little leaguer's elbow. So Panner's disease is essentially a disruption of the growth plate. Now we don't have a great understanding of the etiology or the cause, but what we believe is that there's a, a process of microtrauma. In other words, the bones are banging into each other. When that happens, unfortunately, the bone can lose blood supply. Blood, and bone is just like any other living tissue. Uh, in order to survive, it needs blood supply. If it doesn't get blood supply, then the bone actually dies. And then what happens, the body goes through a process of remodeling. First there's resorption of the bone, then there can be flattening of the bone, and then eventually the bone fills in again. So again, symptoms, basically it's just pain. Child will come and they'll say it's hurting me and they'll be able to pretty much localize one specific area. They may even complain that their motion is, is limited. Uh, and the other thing is that this is a self-limited condition. In other words, it's from repetition. So oftentimes activity <coughs> modification will make the symptoms go away. And that's uh, obviously a main difference between this versus some of the other injuries we talked about, which aren't going to go away unless you know, you s somebody fixes them. This one typically does go away. This is an x-ray representation. And it might be somewhat subtle, but if you look right here where the arrow is, you can see this kind of zone where the, the, the uh, opacity of the bone here seems somewhat different than everywhere else. And what's happened here is there's been damage to the growth plate and now the body's resorbing that damaged bone. So you see this lucency. So oftentimes this is a, a condition that we can see on an x-ray. Sometimes if we're not sure, uh, that's where an MRI can be valuable. An MRI is basically like a fancy x-ray, but just much more detailed. Shows the bone, uh, shows the ligaments, uh, and shows the joint and everything else. If we see something like this on an x-ray though, a lot of times we don't need to f follow that up with, a, with an MRI. And that's oftentimes why when we see in the office, we suggest getting an x-ray because there's a lot we can tell from an x-ray. Uh, treatment, as we said, fortunately this is a self-limiting condition. Uh, it gets better basically without us doing anything except protecting the injured area. And that can, re that can mean just rest from the activity. Sometimes if the pain is significant, you can immobilize the joint for a period of time. But the bottom line is, is that as long as you identify this, it gets better with time and there are typically no long-term ramifications. Osteochondritis desiccans is a somewhat similar condition. The main difference here is that this is something that occurs in those children who have just gotten to the point where their growth plates have fused. Again, this is a situation that happens when there isn't a growth plate, but the mechanism is considered to be very similar. In this case, you get damage uh, to the articular surface. As you can see in this diagram here, the articular surface has a lining on it called cartilage. It's represented in this picture by this white. Okay, and what happens is you get repetitive banging between the bone here and the bone here, and that cartilage, uh, as well as the bone that's right underneath the cartilage called the subchondral bone, actually starts to crack, okay? And you can actually get separation of the bone and cartilage uh, in that particular location from the bone and cartilage in the rest of the elbow. And if it gets bad enough, that piece can actually separate and you can get loose bodies or loose fragments uh, in the joint. This is an x-ray actually looks somewhat similar to the x-ray we saw just before, uh, but what you'll notice is there's two differences. 
Uh, number one, this area, the growth plate is now closed. There still is a growth plate over here, which is the last growth plate to close on the medial epicondyle of the elbow, but the growth plate down in this area, which is called the capitellum, is closed. So now what you have is you have a situation where there's been a micro traumatic event there, and now you actually have a loose body, okay? Now, symptoms are virtually the same. Uh, there's not generally a specific injury. There's pain. In this situation, though, the child may complain that there's actually grinding in the elbow, and if there is lo a loose piece that's detached, then there can actually be locking where the elbow literally gets stuck. So um, treatment-wise, if you get it, uh, find, you diagnose it before there's any separation or fragmentation, then it's the same as uh, what we've been talking about, rest, activity modification, possibly anti-inflammatory medicine and immobilization. Unfortunately, if it gets to the point where there's separation, then you're talking about probably needing an operation. Um, typically, that operation uh, is what's called arthroscopy. Uh, arthroscopy is simply where we put a camera into the joint. We don't necessarily make a big incision and open the whole joint up, but we stick a camera in there, and then through other little incisions, we can use little biting and grabbing instruments and get those little pieces out of there. Um, the last thing that, uh, in terms of specific type of injury that I wanted to talk about is what uh, most people refer to as little leaguer's elbow. You may have heard that term before. Um, what does it really mean? Basically, when people say little leaguer's elbow, what they're talking about is a chronic stress to the elbow that leads to inflammation of the growth plate. Um, risk fac factors, obviously, in order to get this, you have to have an open growth plate. If a kid's done growing, then he doesn't have little leaguer's elbow. He's got something else. Um, overuse. Uh, and poor throwing technique have also been linked uh, to this specific injury. Now, what is the mechanism? Again, uh, we're talking about repetition, okay? What we think happens uh, is that the growth plate fails before the ligament fails. As we saw in the last slide, there's a ligament that connects the bone here down to the bone here. Uh, in a child that still has an open growth plate, that growth plate is weaker than the ligament. So essentially what you have is you have a continuum, okay? The first thing that happens is you get inflammation of that growth plate. The second thing is you get, you can get fragmentation of the, of this part of the bone itself called the epiphysis. And then what you can actually get is you can get separation where this growth plate widens, okay? Basically that ligament is pulling that bone away. So instead of the ligament failing, instead of the ligament tearing, you're actually getting a problem with the growth plate, which again, as we said from the beginning, that's the weak link. Symptoms. Uh, the child will localize uh, pain right to that medial bump on your elbow called the epicondyle. You can get swelling there, you can get loss of motion, uh, and then x-ray wise you can get a situation like this where you see widening. Um, again, uh, the key here is identification of the problem. Um, you know, noticing where the pain is, figuring out the problem is, and then modifying activity. If you catch it in the early stages, then rest is going to solve the problem. Sometimes if the pain is really bad, we'll immobilize the child for a couple weeks and let things calm down. Unfortunately, if it gets to the point where there is separation, then you might, unfortunately, buy yourself an operation. The relatively simple to fix. Ultimately, you put a, a screw across there and bring this back to where it belongs, uh, and then hopefully the child uh, regains full function. So in terms of prevention of little ears elbow, again, it's, it's, the whole idea is identifying what the problem is. We discourage pitching through the pain until you, you know, I've figured out what the problem is. We also recommend a gradual return to activity if you've had a period where you've been injured and you're returning or if you're just coming into the season. Um, the key here is that this problem can lead to permanent problems. You can have deformity, chronic pain, even arthritis. So it's real important to try to identify this as early as possible. Just to follow that up, uh, what else do we know about prevention, specifically when we're talking about elbow injuries, uh, kids playing baseball? What happened was doctors like me that, that see kids and see sports-related injuries noted in the mid-1990s that they seem to be seeing a lot more kids coming in with elbow problems. And they said to themselves, well, wh you know, what's going on? Why are we seeing this? And, you know, I'm talking about guys that, had, unlike me, had been in practice for a long time. If any of you guys follow sports, you probably have heard the name uh, Dr. Andrews. He's the guy that all the professional athletes go to whenever they hurt themselves. And he was one of these guys. And so he said to himself, what's going on? He said, I think it's probably we're seeing kids that are getting involved earlier, kids that are doing more. So his uh, institute called the American Sports Medicine Institute 
along with uh, cooperation from Little League Baseball, Major League Baseball, and USA Baseball, conducted a series of scientific studies to try to pinpoint what the problem was. And this is what they found. Without a doubt, the number of pitches thrown was found to be the single most significant contributor to elbow problems in kids. They also identified some other risk factors. Pitching past the point of, point of fatigue, kids playing year-round baseball without sufficient rest, kids participating in baseball showcases, and throwing at a high velocity. So when they put all this together, that's when we came up with this whole concept of the pitch count. That's where this all came from. And this is just uh, the basic pitch count recommendation, which probably most of you guys are familiar with, uh, that's put out by uh, Little League Baseball. Uh, and again, uh, as you can see, it's, it's age specific. And that has to do with the physiological development of the child when the growth plate is closing, okay? So not only do we have to pay attention to the actual number of pitches thrown at any, on in, any given day, we also have to allow for appropriate rest. So this is just, again, uh, this is actually a recommendation, and again, it's age-related. This is for children between ages 7 and 14. Again, based on the number of pitches, there's a specific number of days of rest recommended. And now what's a day of rest? Well, if somebody pitches on a Saturday, then the first day of rest is Sunday. So if you need three days of rest, no pitching Sunday, no pitching Monday, no pitching Tuesday. You can pitch again on Wednesday. The other question that inevitably comes up, everybody wants to know, what about a curveball? Does that change anything? And interestingly, none of the scientific studies have shown that a curveball versus a fastball or a changeup puts any extra stress on the elbow, okay? Now, those are the scientific studies. But if you ask the guys who do this for a living, you ask Dr. Andrews, he doesn't care what the studies say. He thinks that the curveball is a problem. And what his thought is is that, well, if you're throwing a curveball with exactly the right mechanics and you look at it in a lab, maybe it's not putting any extra pressure on the elbow. But the reality of the situation is not everybody has perfect mechanics. And there probably is an increased risk with respect to pitching a curveball, throwing a curveball for children who haven't reached skeletal maturity. Okay? And so just anecdotally, uh, there are some other recommendations based on that school of thought. And this is, these are just a few of them. Generally, it's considered limiting per year a child to 100, 100, minimum, 100 innings maximum. Back to the curveball issue, it's generally considered kids under 14, probably not the best idea. The other thing is actually taking a break. As kids, as we become more involved in sports, kids are becoming involved younger, kids are also focusing on one specific sport. Used to be that kids would never play one sport year round. That's certainly not the case these days. The recommendation is if the, if the child's a pitcher, that you take at least a three or four month break from pitching per calendar year. And the other thing is radar guns. Again, uh, you know, everything's very competitive. People are looking about, you know, college and scholarships and potentially you know, baseball is a career, uh, and radar guns, guns are very important, but the clinical data doesn't lie. It, spit, pitching at a high velocity definitely increases the risk for injury. With that being said, uh, just some closing thoughts on some general uh, concepts about preventing sports injuries for kids. Obviously, kids need to be well coached and supervised. That's why you guys are here. Um, it's always important to ensure appropriate protective equipment is worn. Uh, the environment, the fields are safe. Um, conditioning is a key, and that's where you know Frank and, and Chris are going to talk some more about stuff of that nature. And then again, recognizing uh, and treating injuries appropriately. Um, know the rules, and again, this concept of, of not playing through the pain. So that brings us to the last question, when do you go see the doctor? Uh, typically, if a child's complaining of pain and there's not an obvious acute injury, and they rest for you know three or four days, most things should get better. Um, other things to look for, inability to play. And the thing I, I always tell kids, if you, you're having pain and you're not able to play to the, to the level that you're capable, well then I think you need to take a step back and say is it really worth being out there and playing at 50%? I think it's more important to figure out what's wrong and getting, that, and getting it better. 
other obvious things, limp, loss of motion, swelling, visible deformity, severe pain. So with that, um, just want to thank everybody for coming. Okay, guys, uh, my name is Chris Reedy. Uh, I am the Athletic Training Program Coordinator here at Coordinated Health. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about overuse injuries in baseball. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about is going to mirror what Dr. Melagari talked. We're going to get a little more into the, the pitch counts and those kind of things. Uh, and some other things that relate to, uh, to youth baseball. Um, as Dr. Melagari mentioned, we, we, throwing injuries in Little League sports is, is at an increase. And we have a lot more athletes that have these injuries at a younger age. And as we talked about, there's a variety of reasons that lead to that. Um, but the problem is we don't want to see athletes have injuries that cause them to have to refrain from sports or not participate in sports any longer for something that could really be prevented. Um, some, some background information uh, as far as studies we're seeing. Um, in 1995, 102,000 children were seen in the ER for injuries related to playing baseball. And I'm sure that number has increased uh, since then, but that's a lot just for baseball, uh, not considering all sports, just for baseball alone. Um, and 50% of all the injuries re requiring medical attention are directly related to overuse, okay? So overuse is, is really the, the issue here when we talk about a lot of these injuries. Um, and uh, in the American Sports Medicine Institute compared research between 1995 and 1999, and again 2000 and 2004, and noticed twice as many ulnar collateral ligament um, reconstructions, known as the Tommy John surgery, uh, at professional level pitchers, four times more UCL reconstructions in collegiate pitcher, pitchers, and six times more UCL reconstruction in high school pitchers. Okay, so that's a pretty high number um, to have going on. Um, the, the elbow is the most frequently reported area of overuse injury in child and adolescent baseball players. Now the shoulder is also a factor as well, and a lot of that can relate to pitching mechanics and those kind of things and how they're pitching the ball, but um, the elbow is an area that we see a lot of problems. 25% of young players experience elbow pain Pitchers have the highest rate of osteochondral lesions, as Dr. Malagari was talking about. Um, and one thing to remember is, while upper extremity muscular soreness is no, a normal part of pitcher development, pain is not. Uh, if, and if athletes having joint pain, that can be a warning sign of something more severe going on. Okay, so it's important to keep that in mind. In a study by uh, I'm going to murder this name, Tetsui Matsuura uh, from the Department of Orthopedics in Japan. He studied 152 baseball players um, ranging from ages 8 to 12 for one season to study their injury incidents related to playing their positions. These players had no history of elbow pain. From the study, 38 players or 25% complained of elbow pain. Out of that, um, 38 players, 26 had limitations of range of motion and or tenderness on the elbow and or valgus stress pain, uh, which is where we stress the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow um, on the inner side of the elbow. And from that, um, of those 26 players, 22% had osteochondral lesions, including 12 pitchers, 6 catchers, three infielders, and one outfielder. So while this is a, a major factor for pitchers, it can also affect other players as well. What he, what he concluded from this study is that 25% of child and adolescent baseball players have elbow pain, and nearly 15% sustain osteochondral lesions per year, and pitchers have the highest rate of these lesions. If these overuse injuries um, occur, prompt diagnosis and treatment can prevent this injury from causing long-term damage. But the key point here is better awareness and education among parents, players, and coaches about risk factors can help prevent these injuries. So you guys as coaches play a major role in helping to control these type of injuries. Um, 
Dr. George Paletta, an orthopedic surgeon uh, in St. Louis, said that there are identifiable and controllable risk factors of which young athletes, parents, and coaches should be aware to, of to help reduce injury. A young athlete should never throw through pain or can, uh, continue to pitch when he or she is obviously fatigued. That's a key point. If that, if that pitcher is in pain or they're fatigued, they should stop pitching. Um, and we, we should also make sure that parents and coaches understand the, the restrictions or the guidelines when it comes to pitch counts and number of games and uh, recovery times. Um, as Dr. Melligari mentioned, the USA Baseball Society and Safety Commission, uh, part of the United States Olympic Committee, um, had the American Sports Medicine Institute in uh, Birmingham conduct a study um, of, of youth players throughout Alabama. And in this study, what they found, um, they, they did a, a season-long game pitch count um, and, and a cumulative count of the pitch type, fastball, changeup, curveball, slider. The outcome um, of the studies were therefore post-game elbow or shoulder pain. So we're looking at after the game, what kind of pain these, these athletes had. In the age group, nine to 14 years, a high pitch count and also breaking pitches, your curveball, your slider, um, were significantly associated with an increase of elbow and shoulder pain. Okay, so we're seeing these injuries with these increased pitch counts. An increased pitch count and cumulative count through the season has been literally associated with increased risk of joint pain. So we should definitely um, um, look at pitch counts and they should be limited, but also we should look at the season cumulative pitch counts as well. Not just what they're pitching in a game, but what they're pitching overall through the season. So here are the recommendations, um, kind of mirroring what Dr. Milligali said uh, for a per age group. Um, and then also um, recovery times breaks it down again by age. So, uh, you know, if you, as we said earlier, it's a day rest. So if you play Saturday, Sunday is your day off, of your day of rest, okay? Um, and it just goes through each age group. And then recommendations for learning various pitches. Um, again, the fastball, great for your age, eight to 10, but as we move, but we wanna avoid those curveballs, those sliders, those kind of things. And then as we increase in age, we can increase the, the difficulty of the pitch. But we wanna make sure those younger players aren't doing these pitches because it, all, it really comes down to mechanics. And if you have a player who's throwing these pitches, Sure, the studies are showing that, it's, that with proper mechanics, it's not a factor, but you can't guarantee that player is, is using proper mechanics. And unless you're doing a biomechanical analysis of their pitching technique, you're not going to know if it's proper. Um, so we want to avoid those pitches for those age groups. Um, this is just uh, some states, and actually Pennsylvania doesn't have this. I checked Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, but um, Maine is one state that has state pitching limits. So they actually have guidelines for their coaches that say what the pitching limits are um, for those athletes. And I'm just referencing it. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's basically following that pattern. A day of rest shall be a calendar day, um, not a part day. It has to be 24 hours later. Um, and it just kind of goes through some different uh, examples. Um, the one thing, though, that uh, point G here, two games in one day with different opponents if a pitcher pitches one inning um, in the first game, they may pitch up to three innings in the second game. Um, you know, something to think about is, is that dangerous? You know, should we have them doing that or not, playing in two games? Um, and regardless of these limits, it, it can still put the athlete in an arm stressing uh, situation. Um, other considerations, uh, pitchers should be limited to two appearances per week. Um, there's something to keep in mind though, and, and you, as you know this, a lot of your players are participating in multiple leagues, playing other positions. Um, 
So we, we want to make sure we're considering that when we're looking at these, these guidelines. You know, if you have a, a pitcher that pitches on your team, but then he also pitches on a team across town, you have to consider that in, in their total pitching count. Because they could be following your guidelines for pitching, but then going across town and, and pitching again, so they're still getting that stress. So it's important to, to realize that. Um, and then we talk about pitching mechanics. Um, the throwing motion is described as comprising six stages. Uh, the wind up, the stride, arm cocking, arm acceleration, arm deceleration, and follow through. Um, and uh, I have a little diagram that kind of shows those, those different phases. And when Frank talks to you guys, he'll get a little bit more into those mechanics and some things you can do to strengthen or reinforce those patterns. Um, and here's just another uh, breakdown. It shows from different angles as far as going through the, the mechanics of pitching. And when I was, um, and also pitching styles as well. When I was looking at this information, I, I found there were some useful sites for pitching mechanics. Uh, most of the sites, though, you have to join or you have to buy a DVD from the company as far as uh, pitching mechanics. But they are available and just some references to those, uh, those sites. So with all this in mind, it stands to reason that we can start these athletes at a younger age learning how to pitch properly. And, and that's the key. And, and teaching correct man mechanics um, from the earliest age can have a big influence on that player's health and longevity in the sport. Um, this information was presented by Bud Black uh, at the annual Injury Prevention Workshop presented by the National Athletic Training Association and Professional Baseball Athletic Training Society. Um, and it's specifically guided to teaching proper overhead throwing mechanics. And he basically, he breaks it down into five absolutes about throwing a ball. How the ball is removed from the glove after catching, how the ball is rotated when it's removed from the glove and the arm is cocked, position of the elbow in relation to the shoulder, and position of the lead foot as it hits the ground, and hand position and release of the throw. And as we, when we look at those, um, taking the ball out of the glove in the proper way in preparation for resultant throw is the first important task observed. As the player removes the ball from the glove hand, the thumbs of both hands should be in a down position in preparation for the cocking of the arm back. Um, and there's a mention of an easy drill. I think Frank and I were talking about this uh, tonight before the presentation and in the organization that he participates in, their players go through this drill using two balls to make sure that they're getting their arms in the, in the proper position to practice and get ready for the throwing. The second ab absolute involves removing the ball from the glove and bringing it back to the cocking position. Um, the finger should remain on top of the ball as long as possible as the arm is brought back and raised in the air. Um, and the shoulder should not be in extreme external rotation. Um, and you want to make sure you maintain a straight line with your target. So you're aiming towards that target. You're, you're keeping uh, the ball in line with the target. The third is the position of the elbow in relation to the shoulder. Um, the elbow needs to remain high, so it should be actually, um, it, this is actually a, a mistake, actually, as I read it. The elbow should be in line with the shoulder. Um, it, it should be in line with the shoulder joint. It shouldn't be above it. It should be in line with the shoulder joint. And the hand should always be positioned behind the ball in this phase of throwing the ball. The back foot should remain in front of the rubber while the lead foot strikes the ground pointed directly at the target. Um, and the player should land on the ball of the foot, not on the heel, and this will cause the foot to internally rotate and change the direction of the pitch. Um, the lead foot should externally rotate at the release of the ball if it's thrown correctly. Um, and if we have the lead foot rotating more one way or the other, it will affect the direction, direction of the pitch. Hand position at the release of the ball should be, remain behind the ball and causing an upper rotation of the ball as it leaves the hand. Medial lateral spin of the baseball as it leaves the hand will result in poor mechanics. So a medial spin results in excess strain to the elbow while lateral spin affects the shoulder. 
Um, follow through should include bending of the trunk, uh, resultant momentum towards the target, throwing hand, moving towards the opposite hip, and back foot uh, pointing outside the heel. So the body should come through as it decelerates into the throw, and it, the arm should can come across the body. Um, Following pitching, these pitching mechanics will assist the coach in teaching the player a successful and safer pitching motion. Um, all pitchers will change the motion to their own style, and even a perfect pitch when it's thrown repetitively can lead to overuse problems. One important point, uh, Dr. Meligari mentioned this, it is extremely important to remove and, um, and treat a player from throwing if pain begins, and if the, uh, especially if the pain worsens with increasing throws. Okay, so if you have a player that's having pain with throwing and it's getting worse the more they throw, you want to pull them out and get them out of the, out of the game. Um, treatment of pain and inflammation with icing regularly, 20 minutes, several times a day, is important. So if you have someone who has that initial injury or they're having problems or pain, ice is your, as we mentioned before, is your friend. Uh, you want to put ice on that, you want to control the inflammation, you want to decrease the inflammation from occurring and decrease the pain. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications can be used to treat pain, um, and uh, again, that should be more geared towards your doctor recommends. And if your symptoms worsen or pain increases, referral to an orthopedic doctor is recommended. Um, and this is more about rehab. Um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on is um, appropriate upper extremity stretching and strengthening exercises should be initiated with a, with a player who's a thrower um, using dumbbells and light resistance bands. And Frank's going to touch on that tonight with you guys. Um, there was a question about elbow. Elbow braces are a limited benefit, but may be used for comfort or to promote a full range of motion. It's more player preference than anything. And another key point that Frank's going to talk to you guys about tonight is core strengthening. Um, and core strengthening can, uh, we have kids here that come to Coordinate Health. It, how young are they, Frank? Eight. Eight years old to come in and do core strengthening programs. So, you know, at a young age, they can work on strengthening the core and improving the core, and it'll, it'll translate into them being a better athlete on the field and translate also into other sports they may play. Um, most complications from Little League Elbow Syndrome arise from a thrower attempting to return to pitching too soon or before the rehabilitation is complete. Um, or from a player trying to play when they're symptomatic. It's really important if you have a player who's having symptoms to get them seen, get them treated, get them taken care of. Um, the presence of pain while performing competitive pitching is highly correlated with an increased risk of medial epicondyl avulsion fracture and the subsequent need for surgical repair. So we, we really want to be careful with these athletes. Um, and athletes should be counseled to stop or avoid pitching at any time when elbow pain is present, and these individuals should seek an evaluation by a healthcare professional before returning to pitching. So it's really important, if you have a player who's having problems with their, with their arm, they should be seen and treated before they return to pitching. A little quiz for you guys. Um, true or false, elbow and shoulder pain are normal parts of pitcher development. False, right, no, it's, it's false. Proper pitching mechanics are important for success and injury prevention at any age. True. And pitch count, <clears throat> days of rest after pitching, and having an off season away from baseball are all important for youth pitchers to reduce risk of subsequent injury in adolescent and teenage years. True, yes. And then these are just some of the references for this presentation. Thank you. You know, you were talking about pitch counts earlier, and I'm, I'm out as far as warm-up goes. I mean, you know, most leagues, uh, you're only allowed to throw four or five pitches in between innings, which is great. But, you know, I think for a game, some of your numbers up there, like the eight, eight, eight U, I think, was 21 pitches that started that game day rest. Hell, you might throw 15 pitches to warm up before the game starts. Did you have any 
authentic percentage or you have any guidelines for that as far as that goes? I don't think there's really, I mean, it's, it's really related more towards the pitching when they're in the game, you know, when they're actually throwing. I mean, obviously you want to have the pitcher warming up and getting prepared. Um, and obviously warm-up pitches aren't going to be at full velocity either. Uh, we're talking about when they're in the game and they're throwing their pitches at, the, at their highest velocities is where you want to have a count on the number of pitches they throw. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll turn it over to Frank. I'm not a Phillies fan, but uh, I used all Philly pictures tonight. Uh, I just happened to notice, uh, getting prepared for the talk the other night, that there was a picture in the morning call of some Phillies warming up uh, in the pa paper, and it, I thought it tied in very well to what we're talking about tonight. What I want to do is, is give you guys some take-home pointers. Uh, you kind of know how, I, how to identify the injuries now, how to hopefully prevent them, but let's take it a step further and put some conditioning or some warm-up in not just their throwing warm-ups and things. Uh, and uh, somebody brought up, what about catchers? What about the infielders? What about the outfielders? It's not just about the pitcher. You guys are you, you're correct, all right? Um, the injury can occur to anybody in the field. And Chris mentioned, actually, that uh, you know, in that study from Japan, that it was across the board. Obviously, the pitcher is under a higher velocity in a shorter period of time. So their, their workload is, is causing a lot more stress there. Let's see if I can get this thing to work right. OK, so just to reiterate, we talked about a lot of these things tonight. I'm a why guy. I want to know what, what caused the injury. Why do I have an elbow injury? And sometimes uh, we chase the pain, okay, meaning that it's really not the elbow's fault. Okay? He just happens to be the weak link in the chain, and he took the hit. Okay? So when you come in and we're looking at a shoulder injury or an elbow injury, Sometimes it's the core's fault. Sometimes it's my hip's fault. And you guys, when you're out there coaching, right, what are we talking about all the time? Okay, the hips. Okay, so if we can really get those hips working appropriately and work the back side of what we call the kinetic chain, the old uh, hip bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones, it, it, it's true. All right, and I'll, I'll lead you down that path in a little bit here so you get a better understanding of what's going on if you don't already have a good grasp of it. Um, so part of the mechanics and, and you know, interesting discussion is the curveball okay, isn't it okay? If the mechanics are proper, you know, maybe it is okay. Um, but at a young age, what happens is the body will do what we ask it to do, okay? Even at our age, okay? All right, it will do because the brain, we, we ask the brain to do a task, throw the baseball, all right? It doesn't care how it gets there, and you guys know that. If you started coaching from this age, you'll see you know, 50 kids throwing it 50 different ways. But what happens? The ball gets from point A to point B, okay? That's success. So either the kid visualizes that and that continues that pattern until we step in and say, okay, we're gonna change that. And the gentleman who actually showed us this is here tonight, okay? Uh, does a real nice job taking the kids through all of those steps and re-educating muscle memory. We talk about golf and we're looking at muscle memory. Okay, same thing with your pitching mechanics. You want to create a positive or the proper muscle memory f for pitching, for throwing, okay, for hitting. Is there one correct way? There's a variation in there somewhere, there's a gray area, but any one of these things here, the lack of flexibility, strength, balance, are going to lead to this, lack of rest, and possibly poor mechanics. That's why rest is important, okay, to let the body recover. It's an amazing machine, but if we don't give it time, to regenerate and restore and get the strength back or, or get that flexibility back, all right, we bring it back too soon, that's when the problems can start, okay? So you guys know what you're like when you're, when you're tired, okay? Yeah, so imagine what the body feels like. And, and Doc put it very well is we, sometimes we assume that these little kids are miniature adults and that they're invincible, okay? Now, they're, they're not, and it, so we need to kind of keep that in, in, in check, okay? What they do have is they have the ability, okay, to get by with a lot of things before they hurt. Compared to us, it'll happen a lot quicker. Okay, so kind of keep the, those those things in mind. Um, so if there's no off-season conditioning going on, right? You see it. It's they they go from uh, spring ball to fall ball to winter ball, and it's going year-round now. Okay, I, I keep telling everybody we become Russia because. <laughs> There's no time. We're training them for the Olympics, right? Okay. 
Uh, so there needs some downtime, we need some conditioning, we need to complement their skill work with some backyard stuff again, okay? Jumping out of the, the, the trees and, and chasing each other and doing those things. Everything's organized anymore, okay? You know, put, put the video games away and, and do some things. I hate, you know, I, I said eight years old and it, and, and it kind of bothers me that I'm organizing play and strength and conditioning for an eight year old, okay? But if that's what I have to do, I'll, I'll do it. I prefer the older kids when, when they're really in tune with what the goal is, okay? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit. I'm gonna give you some good take home points, I hope, uh, with flexibility, balance, and strength. And the reason I, I have this up here and I think is the red dot my laser, okay? That is a great picture of a lot of things that are going on, okay? Chris talked about the follow through, all right? Single leg balance, okay? Right now his right glute, his hamstring, his gastroc is working on decelerating, all right, all that torque generated in his left arm, okay? From the backside of his shoulder, it crosses from his left to his right hip, okay? And so all the kids want to throw harder, and, and, and I think in Doc's slide there, he talked about put the gun away, all right? Put the gun away, because they want to throw harder. And, and, and they'll do what they can to generate, but what they lack, and what a lot of us lack, it's not just the kids, is the brakes, okay? We don't have a good braking system, so we need to train that in there, and then that will slow down the 90 miles an hour, and that helps decrease the injuries. That's part of the mechanical picture that that a lot of us are missing or a lot of the kids are missing. If I don't have good balance, and Chris just talked about how that foot lands, okay? How does this foot land, okay? Has a lot to do with the mechanics, but it all starts with balance on his left foot, right? So pitcher's prayer position here. If I don't have good balance here, it all starts there, and that can change what happens out there. A little change in my landing position will change the mechanics on how my shoulder and ultimately the elbow absorb that force from decelerating. Everybody okay with that? Understand those mechanics? Okay, and then strength. I'm not gonna talk about front side strength, okay? We, we joke around that every Monday is National Bench Press Day, all right, because everybody has to go in the gym and everybody's benching on Monday. What about the rows? What about the lats? It's the pull exercises, okay, that are really, really important for the breaks or the deceleration for the kids and, and, and us, all right? I'm going to start right with the stretching, okay? And I'll show you a couple things take home that you can do with the kids uh, at home, on the field, as a team. I'd be glad to stick around. Uh, the handout's in the back, so on your way out, you can, you can grab it. It starts from, from top to bottom, okay? How many of you heard about that static stretching is bad? It doesn't improve performance. It can actually lead to injuries. You guys hear that, okay? So everybody's doing the dynamic warm-up. Everybody up there knows the dynamic warm-up now, right? Got bad press, about five, I shouldn't say bad press. The dynamic warm-up got all the press, okay, many, many years ago. And what the public and the coaching community needs to understand is that there's a spectrum out there of flexibility, okay? And so we made this assumption because dynamic warm-up improves performance that every kid has good flexibility, right? Isn't that the assumption? Okay. I will not dispute the studies, okay? but we didn't hear the other side of the story, and somewhere in there lies the truth, okay, on, 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 the, on the whole spectrum. So if your athlete or your son uh, has great flexibility, okay, that is the goal, the dynamic right there. That's exactly where we wanna be. But I don't know that if I don't test that, okay? So if we've got someone with a bad motor problem, okay, or weak muscles, and they're hanging on their ligaments or they're protecting themselves, all right, we need to start down in here somewhere to give them that ability again, all right, to get to this, okay? And it's not that this isn't disruptive today, tomorrow, next week. It's over time, okay? It's like taking that rubber band and just yanking on it and snapping it over and over again, just like your pitchers, okay? That's the dynamic, okay? We need that. That's, that's sports. That's athletics. I won't dispute that, okay? There, are, there is a study out there that no one's talking about when they went back and they looked and they actually looked at all the factors that go into uh, when they looked at the performance. The original studies looked at vertical jump and they looked at sprint times, okay, as the performance factors, all right? What they did was they went back and said, well, what happens if we do maybe an active stretch or a static stretch, then we do the dynamic stretch, and then we test the 40, and then we test the vertical? What happens? 
okay? That was a smart man, all right? Because the results were the same as if we just do the dynamic, all right, and go there. If we just do the active or the static and skip the dynamic and try to go to sports, that's where we see the decrease, okay? And in our handout, we address that, okay? So if you take the kids, just like you're pit warming up your pitchers, from slow to a little bit faster, a little bit faster, there's really no change, right? I, I shouldn't be able to tell when he was pitching slow to fast because the mechanics should look the same, right? Okay, it's the velocity that changes and, and the pop in the, in the mid. So what myofascial is, it's trigger point, all right? And that would be for a healthcare professional to figure out what do we need, okay? Some of you guys might have seen some of these in your, your shoe stores out there. It's called the stick. There's foam rollers. Basically what it is, it's the poor man's massage, okay? And you're trying to release what we call the fascial tissue that connects the muscle tissue together, all right? And if that tissue is highly innervated, okay, that's the software package. And that helps us determine uh, velocity, speed, and things like that. And if that fascial tissue is on guard all the time, it's not going to release. It's not going to let you move smoothly, okay? So we would start with something like this or a foam roller to help release that trigger point that's, that's on guard all the time because it's sensing a problem, all right? So we need to kind of shut that trigger point down. Doesn't mean we go right to dynamic right away, but that's, that's, a, that's a starting point. But we would have to evaluate that and take a look at that. Next is the traditional, the static and hold where you, uh, you know, the old hamstring stretch, foot's up here, and I'm gonna hold for 10 to 15 seconds, okay? That's what we would classify as a static stretch where you're holding position under a length of time, okay? I'm not gonna cite the research out, out there for you on that. Just understand that there are levels or phases that you can move through to help. Active is hold and move, okay? Our bodies work in three planes of motion, okay? Here, here, and rotation, right? Injuries occur mostly with rotation. How many of you stretch with rotation? We don't do that, right? Anybody jog, run, anything like that? We stretch our calf straight ahead, right? But when we run, our foot actually pronates and supinates, just like the hand pronates and supinates. That's a function of all three, flexion, extension, here, here, and rotation. So what we like to see is a little bit of this before the dynamic, and that really preps your body before you get going, okay? You're all sitting right now, your hip flexors are shortened, your hamstrings are tight. What do you think the kids are doing all day? They're sitting, right? I won't go off on my tangent, <laughs> all right? But they've been doing that since they were five years old, right? Right, guys? Okay, all right. You go into third world countries, they don't have chairs, okay? Most of those individuals over there, they can drop into a deep squat, no problem, because they've maintained their hip flexibility, everything you guys are trying to coach, turn your hips, turn your hips, okay? So, then we'll get into the, the dynamic. I'll just give you a couple quick, quick ones here to address the elbow, because that's what you guys came for, but then we'll address the other mechanics that could cause, be causing the issue why that elbow might be hurting, okay? Um, just real quick down here, we're gonna, I'll demonstrate this tonight, but this was the picture that was in the paper, and doesn't this look a little bit like that, okay? It's not necessarily dynamic yet, it's more of an active where we're holding a hip flexor stretch, which can be the culprit here, all right? Uh, and we're getting a nice lat stretch up and through the whole system, okay? We're not gonna isolate, we're gonna integrate and pull everything together and teach it how to work better when we get out on the mound, okay? All right, um, do it right, okay? I know you guys, I, I coach a couple different sports myself. You got 15, 20 kids out there and we're over here, we're talking about it, let's run plays, you know, five X, Y, Z, and the kids are over there stretching, what's the plan tonight for practice? And what are the kids doing? goofing around, faking it, okay? All right, so what's the easy thing to do? Coaches, what do we do? Go run a couple laps, right? Isn't that the warm up? Go run a couple laps. Whew. All right, we'll, we'll calm them down. Guys, I'm all for that to get their energy out so, so that you can get them focused. Maybe, you know, right guys? Yeah, yeah okay. Is that what the coach says? Go run a couple laps? 
<laughs> this guy's going there. Okay. So we want, <coughs> what we want to do, though, is, is really get them focused. So if you use that as a tool, all right, to calm them down and, and, and get the energy out because they've been sitting in school all day, I'm all for it. Okay. Again, they're resilient. They'll last a little bit. But when you pull them back in, all right, baseball's played, mo most sports are played standing up. Okay. They may not need this. I don't like to do this unless we actually have to. Okay, let's put them on their feet if they have the ability to and integrate the stretch that mimics more their sporting activity. Doesn't that make a little bit more sense? Okay, so let's turn on some core. Let's turn on some flexibility. Let's turn on the right muscles that they need while they're playing their sports because this isn't doing anything for them. Okay, I can tell you that right now. And the reason I put up here do it right, that's a great rotator cuff stretch, right, Chris? Okay, the sleeper stretch, he's doing it wrong. That's why they probably didn't make the playoffs last year. <laughs> um, again, here, this is poor posture, okay? Notice how many of you are sitting right now, okay? Your, your parents are right, kids, all right? Your teachers are right. Posture has a lot to do, when they come in and see us, the core is about posture. We're looking at posture. Sprinting mechanics, if you guys watched the Olympics this year and they were talking about, I think her name was Allison Felix, okay? When she came across the finish line in the preliminaries, the, the, the commentators made a comp, they, they said something about, she looks relaxed, okay? Because her core was so in tune with what was going on, all right, it was locked up and her legs and arms were just flying around her solid core. That's what it's about. If we can correct posture and then get those arms and legs and hips to move around, you'll get better performance and you'll get decreased injuries. So we don't like to go here, we start from the bottom up, all right, we start with the calf, we work to the hamstring, here's the hip flexor stretch, we wanna get the groin, and then we'll attack the shoulders a little bit. Okay, that should be it. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple take home <coughs> tips here. We talked about bands, we had some questions about dumbbells. All right, I know you all guys all have a baseball bat somewhere laying around, okay? So we can use this as your dumbbell, all right, with the young kids. Uh, the tubing does not have to be strong to start with, okay? We do sell this here in about six foot strips, all right? If you go to uh, some of the uh, sporting goods stores out there, it will be in a, uh, a round tube, okay? Those are usually the higher levels for strength training. So it depends on what age groups you're working with, what, what bands you wanna choose, all right? I brought the green tonight. This is kind of a, a mid-level for, for what we would wanna see, okay? I brought this, this is called an Airx pad. You can use this for balance for your kids that have good balance. Um, I also brought it to protect my knee when I do uh, my quad stretch, all right? So it serves two purposes. But you can certainly have the kids use their, their glove on the, on, on the grass or in the gym wherever you're starting to work out. Okay, so let's start with uh, the forearm because really we're talking about little league elbow tonight. So two stretches and I'm gonna ask you guys to do it with me, all right, because one's pretty easy and the second one is a little bit more challenging. All right, so on the inside of the elbow, which is what we were talking about, in order to stretch that complex there, your wrist flexors are what we're talking about. They all come up here and they attach to the inside of your elbow. So in order to get those, we have to go in the opposite direction. So we need to extend the wrist. So something as simple as this, taking the forearm back, okay, and coming back. You should feel that come right up through here to the inside of your elbow, okay? Very simple. There's a lot of ways to do that, all right? There's a lot of ways, but that's a, that's a quick, easy way. The kids are sitting in the dugout. You can have them turn their hands backward and press down on the bench, okay? And that's gonna put pressure here to stretch out the inside of their elbow, okay? Pretty simple. If you wanna check to see what kind of flexibility you have, put your palms together and raise your elbows. Do you get about 90 degrees right here? If you don't, you have a problem, okay? <laughs> or a potential problem, okay? So you can certainly test your kids, okay? Do you expect the young kids to have that problem? No, okay? They haven't experienced enough, hopefully, overuse yet or, or problems although we, we do a lot of computer work, that's a whole other issue, okay? 
the, the finger flexors also come through this channel up here. To check those guys, can I push my fingers together with my wrist straight? What do my fingers look like? Okay, about 90 degrees. That'd be nice if, if we can do that, all right? If not, you got, we'll, we'll get by, the kids will get by until there's that one incident where it's too much, the overuse, the straw that breaks the camel's back, okay? And then, oh, okay, my elbow's hurting, don't know why, went away, and then it just gets, it magnifies, okay? Let's go to the outside of the elbow, okay? Because that's the back side of the kinetic chain when I'm falling through and, and I'm snapping, okay? That has to decelerate 50, 60, 80 miles an hour, okay? So the outside can take a hit as, as we get older. This is a little bit harder to do, all right? I like to say, here's my duck bill, and it's gonna grab my hand like this, okay? So if you guys do that, you're gonna turn your elbow up and in and your palm down here, okay? So you're gonna wring out your forearm. That stretch should ride right up along the wrist extensors to the outside of the elbow, okay? So those of you guys that are golfers, okay? Same idea. Now, saw a couple people go just like this, all right? Okay, is that good or bad? What am I doing? I got my shoulder, now I got my rotator cuff involved. I don't need two injuries, okay? So let your shoulders relax. My shoulder doesn't have to help on the stretch. Down here, keep it down here, stretch the outside, okay? Inside, outside. Stay away from, okay? Think your, your, your ears are poison to your shoulder, okay? <laughs> That's really what's happening there. Right. Questions on that? Okay. The sleeper stretch, again, most of the kids this age don't need the sleeper stretch, okay? They don't need that. What they need is they need more stability in the back side because the stability on those shoulder blades that live on my spine here, okay, if I've got, if those guys are stable, all right, that will keep my rotator cuff nice and free. But what happens is, what, what we do is we stretch the rhomboids and we pull that shoulder blade way around the side of my body when we've done this, right? And we do this, where's my scapula going? It's going around my rib cage and on the back. I'm not getting what I really want to get, which is this inferior capsule, what we call here, all right? So it'd be better to strengthen these rhomboids, keep my shoulders back, right, good posture, and now let my rotator cuff do his job. So we like to see a little bit more stability on the backside, okay? What's a good warm up, what's a good shoulder exercise for young kids? Crawling, okay? Bear crawl, don't go forward, go backward. Go sideways, okay? Have them do it, they won't like it. It's also a great poor exercise if they do it right, okay, going back to do it right. They have to keep their hips down. It goes to a plank. You guys do planks with the kids? Okay, all the kids do planks. Make sure you're doing it right, okay? And then what the, the crawl is, the crawl now becomes the plank with arm and leg action. But you're turning on those scapula stabilizers. So if you don't have this and you don't have dumbbells, it's a great tool. I work with some local high school baseball and softball teams. They don't like it but they do it, okay? And you'll, you'll see a big difference uh, in their mechanics and in their velocities when, when you implement that into the program. Okay, so that was the upper body. I'll give you a couple more uh, stretching take-homes. Does anybody have any questions on, uh, on those upper exercises? What, the, what they'll wanna do is if they're standing like this, okay, and, and girls are more notorious than, than boys to stand and hang off their ligaments, we want the feet to line up straight. So w when he comes here and walks out, here's my plank, my heel's being pushed on the ground, keeping that locked, and then shift the hips left and right, okay? And then what I ask the kids to do is not drop down like Brett did, okay? It's natural, they, they wanna take a break, okay? You want them to walk back and stand up. Okay, that's a deadlift. You're turning on their glutes, that's huge. Okay, that's all your hips, that's all your hips. So you want to turn, if you go back to the picture of Lee, right, on his follow through, 
that's your deadlift. In the gym, when we lift, one of the things we want to get to with, the, with all people, not just the kids, the adults, is that is called a Romanian deadlift, single leg Romanian deadlift or a deadlift, whatever. That's the best exercise that anybody can do, okay? If it's done right, there's no such thing as a bad exercise, only an exercise that's done incorrectly, okay? That causes the problem. So what we did with Brett there was that stretch puts my gastroc on stretch in this motion going front to back. Now I want to teach my ankle how to pronate and supinate to stretch the whole complex. So when he shifts his hips left and right, what that does is that goes, the gastroc has two heads. One's the outside, one goes to the inside up here. So we're getting both heads on his gastroc, but we're also taking his foot and we're driving him into pronation and supination, okay? So what's happening way down there when he goes to round the base or he, he goes and it's a pickoff and he dives back is I've taught his ankle how to move, okay? Let's go to a pitcher, okay? Coming up here, what has to happen way down there for me to drive and, and pitch to home base, okay? I need to pronate. If I don't pronate down there, that's affecting the whole kinetic chain and what's coming out here through my elbow, okay? We can go all the way to the big toe, all right, and see that it causes a rotator cuff problem in, in our higher level pitchers, right? So that's where everything starts. So that's why in your, in your packet, on your way out, you'll, we start with the calf stretch. Then we go to the hamstring, all right? Then we go to the groin, and I'll show you the hip flexor stretch in there because it really ties everything together nicely. It's one of the last stretches that, that you wanna do. And so have them kneel on their glove. Again, their hips need to be lined up square, all right? You're gonna ask them to lunge, and the knee can go over the toe. It's actually designed to do that, that's okay. What you wanna look for is posture, okay? And you'll see it in the really, really flexible kids in their spine is they'll arch as they run through. Bad news, okay, for the back, all right? So we wanna work on that core. So this hip, again, we're gonna turn the glutes on and push through the front of the hip. We're looking for a nice stretch in through here, okay? And then you do a military press or you do an overhead press, okay? What that does is that takes all the tissue up through the abdominal, through the chest, all right, and puts that on a nice stretch. So the stretch will increase when you go here and then press, keeping the hips locked, good spine, okay? Might take a couple sessions with them to get them used to that, but that's okay. Get them out of there, then take it back, and just like the pictures of the Phillies, you're gonna go forward, and now we're gonna move them in the lateral plane. So you're gonna have them drop arm and reach at the same time, okay? Then the last thing you're gonna do that there wasn't a picture up there is you wanna make them look more like a pitcher, okay? So you're gonna lunge, okay? Foot lands on balance, right? They're pointed and they're what? They're up here, heads here. So get them used to keeping their heads still. Shoulder rotation here to release the neck and coming back up through here. And that completes the stretch then, okay? Questions? Everybody okay? All right, so then when you're done, uh, you, you'll see in the, in the handout, you go to a bridge, then you go to your plank, then you go to your bird dog, you do a couple balance exercises, right leg and left leg, they all need it, <clears throat> and finish up. Okay, everybody okay? All right, so let's go back to the elbow, all right, because that's what we're talking about tonight. But that's how the backside you'll help affect that elbow that maybe it wasn't the elbow's fault, he just took the hit, okay? So, with your bands, okay, you can do a couple of different things here to strengthen the elbow and strengthen the rotator cuff, okay? Let's start with the cuff first, okay? When you hold your band like this, you go inside and out, all right? And we're just gonna do a, what I call a frisbee, a backhand in tennis, okay? Um, I always like to put uh, everybody in an athletic position, okay? All right, because we don't do anything up here in sports, we're always here, okay? And we come back together. Out, pause for posture, right guys? 
and then we let it come back together. All right, very simple, okay, something they can do. If it's tied to the door, I can do one hand, but I don't like to go here and like this because I need the backhand mechanics. So I like to put them in an athletic position, single arm, going back. So anytime I do a backhand or if in baseball, if I'm, always, I'm throwing here, all right, so when you're strengthening this way, I put left foot forward, backhand is always same side, okay? So same side would be here, okay? So I could certainly do that. Brett, would you be so kind as to hold that for me, please? Okay, we can put them on one knee, okay? If I'm landing on my left foot when I pitch, let's finish with that mechanics here. Come back, what did Chris tell me about elbow mechanics? Higher or same level or below? Okay, so I'm gonna come here, pull back, pause, and release. Check my shoulder, doesn't wanna do this. The whole shoulder blade wants to pinch on the back side, get that breastbone up and extend right here, okay? And let that come through slowly. I'm strengthening the back side so my elbow doesn't take a risk. Is my elbow getting in strengthening in this? It is, because if it wasn't, it would flex like that, okay? So I'm working isometric here on my wrist. I can also take that here and I can go to that level. That's if you have a band, okay? Those are some basic backside mechanic strengthening exercises with your bands. We talked about the rows, anything with the row, but I'm gonna put you on duty again here, okay? Rows, again, I take an athletic stance, I can go bilateral or here, pull, pinch, pause, again, posture and release. Pull, pinch, pause, hold and release. Thanks, bud. All right, let's say you don't have a band. Most of the kids all have a baseball bat, right? Okay, so we can go pronation or supination, pronation. If I wanna increase the torque, just have them grab the bat here. I'm not gonna start there, okay? I don't care what they say or how strong they think they are. You're gonna bring them to the middle of the bat, find the balance point, and then you can take it out here and begin to work pronation supination, okay? Not a lot of reps to start with, maybe 10, okay? Slow and controlled. At the end range, what are they gonna get? Maybe a little stretch on flexibility, okay? You can go that way. I can go here and down, okay? I'm gonna ask you guys with, from baseball, is that good or bad? Is, is there more purpose to do this? Or should I have them do more of this? What's more sport specific? When they come through, are they bending their wrists? What do they do? Come here and they roll out, right? They pronate and supinate. If those wrists break, what have they lost? power, okay? As soon as that wrist breaks, that's power position in your wrist right there, okay? Right there, you guys taking um, Taekwondo and those, that's power right there, weak, okay? Brain, if, if, if you're out drinking and you try to punch the wall like that, your brain won't let you punch the wall as hard, okay? But there it will, okay? That's, that's power right there, okay? So is it okay to strength train like that in that position? It is, but if I wanna make it more sport specific to what's happening, got to do that from a batting standpoint, okay? From a pitching standpoint, this is happening, correct? So I need to work this also, all right, coming back this way, and your bats all have different weights for deceleration mechanics, okay? And here's your, your basic wrist curl.